Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. We are a little bit late, but there are problems with the organization. You know, there are some problems with connection, but I think we should start. And this session is about enhancing pathways for vaccine assessment and national decision making, a driver of resilient health systems. I mean, we, we know that vaccines are the most important uh, technology in preventing infectious disease, nevertheless, and we have seen, of course, how much they are important in this current pandemic. Uh, nevertheless, there is a problem. I'm, I'm not uh, uh, repeating the story that we know very much. The value of vaccines is perceived as relative. Even now, in many countries, uh, the booster dose is not particularly attended, and we will have a problem of a winter in which uh, most fragile people will die because of this. So we have to think about how we can overcome this problem as a public health people is not only important to underline the importance of vaccines, but to do something in order for vaccines to be widely distributed. And there is another complication that, that we share at European level that many times uh, the, the pathways of uh, uh, um, regulation and uh, introduction of vaccine into the national schedule is very fragmented and very heterogeneous. So the session of today is about how we can overcome this difference, how we can better use vaccines in the right way, how we can speed up the process from research to implementation. And we have a parterre de roi because we, we start with a presentation by Vaccines Europe, by uh, um, the organization that is promoting vaccination all around. And, uh, uh, which we, uh, we have worked very, very well during the pandemic. Uh, and I mean, if you look at uh, the new book by David Quammen uh, about uh, 90 days from the inception of a vaccine to realization of Moderna, I think this is a great achievement, not to speak about the incredible production and distribution and procurement. I was part of that during that time when some countries, uh, uh, namely Italy, uh, France, Germany, and the Netherlands start the process of procurement, but then European Commission took over and make a very, a very incredible uh, mm, uh, step forward. So we will start with a presentation and then we will have a, a panel discussion. Uh, and I will invite Sibylia Quilici, who is ex ex Executive Director of Vaccines Europe, to give the presentation about the key points uh, for the proposal that Vaccine Europe is doing. And then we will have a panel with uh, Martin Postman, Professor of Global Health Economics, University Medical Center Groningen and Faculty of Economics and Business, and member of UK Joint Committee, Committee on Vaccination. Elena Petelos is lecturer in evidence-based medicine and senior research fellow, University of Crete and Maastricht University, and vice president of the UFA HTA section, and Martin Ingersen, Policy Officer, Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Unit at the Director General for Health and Food Safety of the European Commission. So, Dr. Quilici, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, you can turn me down one. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. Uh, thank you for everybody to, to join. Um, is that loud enough? Yes? Uh, so maybe just very briefly, I will introduce uh, Indeed Vaccines Europe, uh, which is a specialized group, uh, vaccines group within the European Federation of the Pharmaceutical Industry and Associations. And our role is really to stress and defend vaccines and vaccination specificities in the EU, in national policies, as well as in legislative environment. So vaccines is really, I mean, it's, we all know it's really a distinct product and it's really different from uh, pharmaceuticals for several reasons. They are a preve preventative tool. We do prevention and minister generally for uh, healthy uh, people in a large number. They are also highly technological biological product with complex and let's see research, uh, development, manufacturing and control processes. And when we look at population access to, uh, to vaccines, it largely depends uh, on the inclusion in national immunization programs, which itself or themselves are actually subject to national recommendations. Um, and these recommendations is in turn dependent on the perceived epidemiological risk uh, by the national health authorities, but also the cost that the implementation of such programs may uh, impose. And then population access to vaccines and the role of vaccine assessment and decision-making pathways in that context is one of several topics that we, uh, as Vaccines Europe, have been working uh, on over a number of years now. 
And our approach is really to, uh, to be evidence-based and collaborative. And we really want to thank the European uh, Public Health Association for giving us the opportunity to this uh, symposium to present to you some of the, of the findings, the key messages uh, of our new policy papers. I, I bought here a, a copy. We didn't do a massive printing, but this is a document that I'm going to, uh, to present today. Uh, and, and the aim is really to, uh, to have you to contribute to, uh, to, to the dialogue on this topic. We recognize that the stakeholders across the vaccine ecosystem will have their own perspective and contributions to make. And for us, it's really important that uh, we share uh, the, 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 these findings and listen as well to, uh, to your feedback. So with regards to our policy paper, uh, so it bids upon uh, an extensive research uh, project that Vaccines Europe conducted together with renowned uh, leading experts on vaccination. And I'm here representing that, uh, that work, honestly, but the experts that contributed to this paper, some of them are actually in this room. So uh, I, I give the credit to, to those uh, that have been actually working on, on, on this research. And the aim of the work was really to better understand the vaccine's journey from the point that you get the marketing authorization to population access across the 27 uh, EU member states. We also included the UK because at the time the, uh, the UK was still part of the uh, European Union. Uh, and this is what we call the vaccine access pathways. The findings were published in 2021 in the journal Vaccines. A key role uh, in these pathways is placed by the National Immun uh, Immunization uh, Technical Advisory Groups, what we call night tags uh, in a simple way, and they're all present in the 27 member states. And this is a really a specificity compared to pharmaceutical, for instance. And here again, when we look at the role of the HTA, they are very less uh, involved uh, in the recommendation process for vaccines, and actually in Europe, is uh, only half of the European countries that uh, utilize the, uh, the HTA bodies for, for such recommendations. So broadly speaking, when we look at uh, the findings of our, of our research, um, we confirm that there is a complexity and heterogeneity of the vaccine assessment, decision-making pathways, for example, concerning the, the role of the public bodies, as well as the steps to be undertaken to make those assessments. There is also a significant variation in time to population access for new vaccines, and there are many opportunities to improve the design and functioning of these pathways. Well, the image that you see at the bottom of the, uh, of the slides um, illustrates, in fact, the key steps for the vaccines assessment, decision-making pathways, and, uh, and you can see there are 12 of them but not all those steps are actually existing in all EU member states. So now, with regards to the mapping that we performed during, uh, in the research, uh, it covers the entirety of the assessment of the and the decision-making pathway for the 27 member states as well as the UK. In this included whether the national pathways uh, was forward-looking processes such as uh, having a horizon scanning or early advice, uh, who initiates the assessment, the key drivers for the recommendation by NITAGs or HTA bodies, whether it is public health, clinical factors, economical, uh, economic factors, such as budget impact, cost effectiveness, etc. Uh, we looked at also who made the final de uh, policy decision on whether to include a new vaccines in the national immunization program. Uh, we look at the, the type of procurement and whether the, the procurement was performed at national or regional level or both. And we were able to collect the data to uh, all EU member states and the UK, with the exception of Romania, which did not have a night tag at the time of the research. Another important aim of the research was to provide up-to-date analysis of time to population access for newly approved vaccines across the 27 member states and the UK. Um, as when we look at, at the time we, we looked at this data, there were no public up-to-date publication with regards to this information, and the, the few that we could find were only focusing on two countries. The analysis was uh, 
the, the time to population access, in fact, the way it was defined is the time between uh, marketing authorization and the date of which the funding was effectively implemented. So it's, it's a range time. And, and, uh, and whether the funding was implemented uh, from public uh, procurement or with reimbursement. How we looked at this time to population access, we also uh, used three uh, vaccine examples uh, covering the life course, so pediatric, adolescent, and adults. So for pediatric, we look at the time to population access for the pneumococcal vaccines. For the adolescents, it was HPV vaccines. And for adults, it was the quadrivalent flu vaccines. And what we found uh, out of, of this was quite a significant uh, variation in the median time to population access across the EU. And as you can see from the map, we have just in seven countries a median time to population access that was less than two years. In 10 countries, it's from two to six years. And in nine countries, which represent a third of the European Union, it's beyond six years. So these results means what? It means that in some EU member states, uh, citizens may have to wait significantly longer uh, to, uh, to have access to new vaccines than uh, their counterpart in other member states. So in a context where if you consider vaccine as uh, a contributor to building resilience of our society and the, uh, and the healthcare system, this could be an issue to have such delay in access across the population of Europe. So turning down to, to the findings into proposals, uh, our new policy paper provides four key principles uh, for enhancing the vaccine as assessment and decision-making pathways. The first one is timeliness. So timeliness of vaccine assessment and final decisions on inclusions in national immunization programs, inclusiveness of all relevant stakeholders' uh, opinions into the work of the night tags and HTA bodies, consistency of processes, methods, and approaches for vaccines assessment and decision making, transparency regarding the role of the public bodies and rationale for assessment and decisions. So for each of these principles, uh, uh, of, of these um, uh, principles, yes, we, we have key actions uh, that we, uh, we propose. Here is a snapshot huh, of, the, of the proposals that are contained in the, in, in the policy document. It's much more detailed in the, in the, in the paper, but uh, what we want to, to, to is to give a, a snapshot of, of this type of proposals. So with regards to timeliness, uh, we make some suggestions with regard to how to improve this time to uh, population access. So with regards to, uh, to timeliness, we can look at how to strengthen the night tag resources and capacities, uh, where in terms of resource constraints, clearly uh, this could be uh, a reason for delay uh, affecting the speed, in fact, of the assessment. So ensuring that the right level of resources uh, is provided to night tags is really important. And also the capacity with regards to life course immunization because the, the national immunization programs have evolved quite significantly over the, 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 the last decades and is going to evolve even more in, in the coming years. We have now immunization programs that should cover not only pediatrics but also, uh, as I mentioned already, adolescent, adult, and older adults. That's what we call the life course. And ensuring that as part of this night tags, we have the, the right expertise, not only pediatricians, but also uh, potentially hematologists, pneumologists, etc., that can really uh, work on, on this recommendation with a life course perspective is important. Uh, implementation of horizon scanning and early advice um, to ensure that the night tags are optimally prepared to assess vaccines in a timely manner. This is critical to have a, a view of what is going to come next. And horizon scanning notably is, is really important because this is a way to uh, contribute to better planning with regards to vaccination budgets. And the third point related to timeliness is what we call sustainable immunization financing that will be needed if all the vaccines that we consider bringing a significant value, broad health, uh, economic and societal value, 
uh, uh, for the inclusion of in NIP needs to be financially supported. But immunization financing is not about ensuring that you have the budget for the vaccines. It's also about ensuring that you have the budget to support the infrastructure that will uh, support the, the, the implementation of the programs or the recommendation of the programs. And this also fits with regards to the, the, the funding for the night acts or the HTA bodies in order to, to, to strengthen their resources. The second um, principle that we have related to inclusiveness here, our key point is really that we should have mechanism for uh, consultation with all stakeholders. And we suggest notably that the scope could be really about involving the civil society, patients' representative, for example, in the activities of the night eyes. And the aim here is really their involvement in the broad, broad function as advisory body uh, on immunization programs, that said, the aim is not to, uh, to extend this to the vaccine assessment, which this needs to be uh, uh, retained to, uh, to their scientific character strictly. The other two key principles, consistency and transparency. So with regards to consistency, the first here, we, we call for consistent process within the countries for the assessment of the vaccines, and notably for the adoption and the use of a decision analysis framework. The second, we think that there is room for convergence between national approaches to vaccine assessment. So in that regard, the European regulation HTA uh, Health Technology Assessment can make a significant uh, contribution to that. And this only if the vaccine specificities are actually recognized and taken into consideration, and the, if the, uh, through the uh, uh, implementation of the uh, EU uh, regulation on HTA, uh, it is actually implemented by the member states. And I will come back to this point. Related to transparency, uh, in particular, we want to emphasize the importance of publishing the uh, rationals undertaken by the, the night times with regard to their recommendation and final policy decisions related to vaccines inclusion in national immunization programs, as well as their funding. And we see that transparency uh, can also uh, provide a way to, uh, to ensure that there is a good circulation of the information uh, within the vaccine ecosystem and can thereby make a contribution to, uh, to, to building vaccines confidence. So understanding even for the, the, the lay public, I would say the civil society, but the lay public, how the decision are made with regard to uh, when a new vaccine is uh, implemented in a national immunization program where the decision is coming from, how it is made, why, and how it is funded, can really support uh, vaccines' confidence then. So all what I mentioned here and the key steps are really uh, driven by uh, at the national level, and this is natural because uh, national immunization programs, health in general, is actually a national competence. However, we do see the scope for uh, the European Union to, uh, to support the improvement uh, of the access pathway. And here, for the sake of time, I'm not going to, to go too much in the details because uh, then all is, is in the paper. Um, but what we can really stress uh, with regards to the support of the EU, there are three key points for us that is of importance. The, the first one is about the development of non-binding uh, guidance to member states on best practices and methodologies for vaccine assessment and decision making. And this can be done via the uh, EU Council uh, recommendations, for example. The second point is related to uh, the establishment of a European Vaccines Clinical HTA Committee to contribute to good implementation of the uh, European regulation on HTA, as I mentioned earlier, and notably with regards to the development of guidance on vaccine-specific clinical HTA methods and processes, because of the specificities of the vaccines, it's really important that we have dedicated guidelines on how uh, this clinical HTA method and processes can be done. And the third uh, and last point I, I wanted to, uh, to cover is related to sustainable immunization financing. So here again, a, a critical point, uh, just, just to give a, a perspective what we insist so much with regards to immunization financing, is just that 
For everything, uh, uh, EU member states spend less than 0.5% of their healthcare budget on immunization programs at large, not for buying vaccines, but for everything, communication, training. I mean, it was already mentioned in the plenary as well, the importance to, to, to train the, the healthcare providers, for example. But it's also here in, in, in the topics that we want to cover about building the capacities and ensuring that the uh, recommended bodies have the, the, the relevant resources uh, to run the assessments. And here again, this is where the European, the European Union can have a role to play, notably with regards to, uh, in, in the context of the European semester, that could uh, provide an appropriate framework for such uh, work. So just in conclusion, as if efforts that we want to, to, that we are working on with regards to improving vaccine assessment and decision-making pathways, we believe that really can contribute to building uh, a, a more resilient health system, which is quite uh, the, the, the key uh, uh, theme uh, of this conference. And of the uh, many actions, the, the, the actions that we can really uh, play on here is ensure more timely population access to new vaccines, uh, as, as we've seen. Um, greater foresight, so in, in, in anticipation, looking at what will come next in terms of new vaccines, new generation of vaccines, and ensure that uh, we have a timely assessment, but also the relevant sustainable financing uh, to support that. Uh, support as well the transition to life course immunization, this is really important. And again, it was mentioned during the plenary, the impact of climate change. The impact of climate change on infectious diseases will be significant potentially. And this will also have an important role with regards to the need to prevent much more infections in the adult population. Um, and last but not the least is uh, ensuring greater transparency of the vaccine assessment with the aim to strengthen vaccines confidence. I'm fine, finished. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So there are three concrete proposals by Vaccine Europe, and I think this is very important in the current framework, both from the mm, legislative point of view. I would remember that according to the Maastricht Treaty and to the cross-border directive, uh, vaccination is explicitly excluded by what a citizen can look for when he or she moves from his or her own national country to another country. And uh, these are three concrete proposals that have to be discussed. In case you have comment or remarks, please save it for later. Now we have the comments and remarks by the panel, starting from Professor Posma. And Professor Posma is the peculiar situation of advisors and consultants both in Europe and in the UK. So do you see difference and how do you see this proposal in the framework of your current activity? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the chance to, to talk a little bit about, uh, about, ab about this. Is it, if, is it okay if I give a, f a few thoughts uh, now? Yeah, I think that, uh, and I, I want to relate that to the, to the, the, the aspects of uh, just mentioned by Sibelia on the timeliness and the transparency, uh, consistency, um, and uh, inclusion. <coughs> so if I start, uh, uh, with, with also what, what you just uh, showed on the screen, uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, uh, being uh, uh, being prepared for the unexpected. I think it, it was just yesterday that we had a uh, together with my uh, a colleague uh, Cornelis uh, Boersma in uh, in Groningen, a colleague in Groningen. Uh, we had a paper in the, in a Dutch uh, newspaper uh, exactly on. Uh, the issue that uh, that, that vaccines uh, uh, come uh, come late, uh, yeah. uh, we had in the Netherlands a discussion on uh, one specific example is the meningococcal B uh, vaccine, which has been uh, denied by the, uh, the the Dutch NITAC, which is the Health Council, uh, just two weeks ago, and uh, our paper, uh, uh, our newspaper uh, article argues that. Uh, you know, these, these vaccines should be much more considered because it's always about costs, of course. It's about budget. It's about, about cost effectiveness that is not achieved. Uh, the epidemiology of meningococcal B is low at the moment. So if you take the current epidemiology, uh, you might end up uh, not cost effective. But we also know with infectious diseases, 
that, yeah, the unexpected, or maybe it is actually the expected, we know that once it will go up again. So rather than, uh, than uh, uh, deny currently uh, a vaccine like that one because the epi is low, be prepared for a, for a higher epidemiology that will come and, and, and a, a, a avoid. Uh, and so act rather than, than react. Um, and uh, a bit similar discussion uh, also concerning, uh, of course, the uh, viral infections, uh, flu, COVID, uh, RSV, there's an RSV vaccine, uh, many RSV, various uh, RSV vaccines coming. Um, uh, uh, huge opportunities to, to uh, avoid uh, uh, lots of uh, demands for intensive care beds uh, in the winter. So uh, rather be prepared and uh, rather see the vaccines as an investment. That was, a, that was one, the, the point that we made. And then if I, if I continue to, to uh, co uh, specifically the paper that Sibelia um, uh, showed us, uh, which we had the, the Legle et al. paper in, in, in vaccine, um, she, she argued, uh, we analyzed uh, that the time to mark to population access for vaccines being six years or more, if you compare it to an oncology drug, it's less than two years. Uh, so, so there is a huge uh, difference in, in, in this respect. And this may be related to the uh, indeed complex, as, as also Sibelia argued, complex and, and sometimes also non-transparent approach that uh, is taken by NITEX and health technology assessment bodies in the field of vaccines. Uh, I, uh, only in the Netherlands, where I come from, the, 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 the interaction between the, the, the Zorg Institute, the Care Institute, and the Health Council is, is, is pretty complex and fully intransparent. Something that is coming also, uh, uh, which, 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 which is also uh, affecting uh, uh, the issue, uh, is that uh, uh, if you look at cost effectiveness, which is specifically my field, uh, vaccines are, are uh, considered at a, at a very low uh, threshold per life year. Eh? We are only wanting to, sp to spend 20,000 euros per life year. In the Netherlands, that is formal, uh, formal, formally uh, done like that. 20,000 euros per quality for vaccines, whereas again, oncology is uh, up to 80 or 100,000 euros per quality. And this is intransparent as well because it generally it, it is, uh, we don't know. Um, so the consistency uh, aspect, uh, uh, infectious diseases, of course, do not respect borders uh, between countries, yet major differences exist eh, between, uh, between the systems uh, uh, that we have. Um, and uh, in, the, in, in, in our paper, we, we identified at least four archetypes of, uh, of, of uh, systems uh, differing with respect to the level of decision-making. Uh, UK, where I'm in the JCVI indeed, a very national type of decision making, but very different in Italy, Spain, or Sweden for that matter. Uh, the reimbursement sometimes is uh, population wide. It can also be, I think, in Germany, for example, the Krankenkassen, the, the health care insurance is involved in, is a bit more like an individual based uh, reimbursement system. Some countries use tendering, uh, like the like like the UK. Some some countries do do do, do not uh, have do not have such an approach. So there are there are and, and of course the epidemiology, because that that, that 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 surely comes in. There are differences between epidemiology between countries, but but again, as I said, uh, infections do not uh, uh, respect borders. So so there are, there are differences, but only to a certain extent. But these differences in uh, epidemiology are, I think, magnified uh, between the countries, leading to completely, in, uh, completely, at least differing uh, immunization programs. And then, then my last point on the inclusiveness uh, uh, concerns, uh, uh, for example, the equity aspect is, I think, an interesting one. Uh, I've just come from Vienna, from the ISPOR, the International Society of Pharmacoeconomics, and we have this famous value flower in, uh, in ISPOR, which, which identifies all the different values of, uh, of drugs. And equity is actually considered uh, a, 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 a value of, uh, of a drug, of a vaccine, which, uh, which is actually generally not, not uh, taken, uh, taken, uh, taken into account, for sure not in, in traditional cost-effectiveness analysis. And at the Global Vaccine Conference in Italy, which we had uh, you know, two months ago, 
um, we we uh, presented uh, we presented some 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 work there. We 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 identified with stakeholders what what uh, what values of vaccines should we actually think about uh, and and start to include in our discussions and even in our calculations concerning the cost effectiveness and and uh, amongst uh, peace of mind uh, effects uh, and and uh, macroeconomic effects, also equity came came up as a as an, an asset of vaccines to, to uh, achieve, uh, uh, to, to reduce differences between socioeconomic uh, uh, classes, for example, in access to, to care. Thank you very much. Can we move to Dr. Petelos? Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, to say that some of the things Martin already mentioned is good. I'm not going to go into, but indeed we have a lot of heterogeneity. He, I think, um, before going on to continue what I think is a very valuable paper, um, he uh, extrapolated on some aspects which are very relevant from a health economics perspective, but we also have some, if you like, more basic issues. Um, issues in terms of recommendations from a clinical effectiveness um, viewpoint. Um, not efficacy, but effectiveness in your world populations. And I think uh, a, a very big challenge uh, for those of us that are involved in, in HCAO vaccines for many years is the fact that for the past three, four years, the focus has been COVID vaccines. And of course, COVID vaccines are a very particular type of vaccine um, for uh, a type of virus uh, which requires you to immunize or vaccinate again and again. And this presents a lot of challenges in terms of how you monitor efficacy populations and primarily also how you communicate with uh, the people and the healthcare practitioners. So I'm going to try and give a little bit of an overview from a transparency perspective and how we think this links to evidence um, generation, starting from data generation to synthesis, um, to keeping it up to date because we have a never changing benefit risk for different populations. And of course, going over to to actually calculate uh, other benefits, economic benefits, but also there are many different other benefits you can see at societal level. So the discussion, I think some of you were in this morning uh, in the HTA regulation uh, workshop for collaboration we did. Uh, the HTA regulation has not primarily been developed for vaccines. Vaccines being very cheap were not the biggest challenge. Oncological drugs have been the biggest challenge and the main focus. Uh, nevertheless, vaccines are regulated as medicinal products in the EU. They are within the scope and remit of the European Medicines Agency. So, of course, in terms of how they get authorized at the EU level, there is a lot of transparency of what gets submitted and what gets released. Mm, this information does not necessarily, of course, reach every pediatrician, uh, every general practitioner, the people that immunize in the field. So the information usually has to go to member states and then be adapted locally uh, via any tag or any other committee because we have also a lot of variability there. Um, a big challenge also is the type of evidence of trial generation in terms of development of R&D that gets submitted um, to have a, a vaccine approved. And um, in, in terms of transparency, I think there are many people that I come across that have been in, in different clinical fits for many years and they're not necessarily aware of who does what and what the role of the EMA is, what the role of the European Commission is in approving vaccine, uh, who determines procurement at EU-wide level, for which we had um, different kind of transparency issues and who determines contractual obligations, liability issues, um, how we record potentially damage uh, to health or harm to health. And then, of course, having all of this adapted at the local, at regional and even local level. And we also very often have language barriers to add to that. From the perspective of, of practitioners, I mean, I'm half, half my life is in Greece and half of it is in the Netherlands. But we had to vaccinate 600,000 people in Greece. And this also meant that we had to wait for recommendation from the National Committee, not only for COVID, but for everything. And then this has to be communicated to populations that have uh, let us say, a very high heterogeneity level in terms of trust to institutions and to governments. And I mean, some of you may know also that Crete is, can be quite uh, uh, strong in terms of perceptions of why if you're not ill, you should not have any intervention applied on you. Um, so we have also had a lot of challenges for influenza vaccines in the past. 
and we had some issues in terms of how the vaccines are being deployed and how evidence is being collected. And this includes both in terms of how well they work and in terms of what time of side effects, harm or long-term effects may, may do. And there we have, of course, um, serious infrastructure problems or issues across, I think, the region and globally in terms of how we collect evidence for that. Um, hopefully we have new tools, which you did not discuss in your recommendations, but I think this is something we can enrich on. So you have new tools that can be utilized. Going forward in terms of um, discussing what comes and, and uh, in terms of transparency, I think when we saw your, your recommendation, your papers, you focus very much on the role of NETAGs and the role of OEC, but there are also many other plays along the way uh, which nationally or locally determine uh, the uptake and the acceptance of these vaccines. And not all of these players are uh, formal players in the structure. So they could be informal players, they could be stakeholders that are not mapped, they do not necessarily have an institutional road, uh, but, but can be very strong advocates. And uh, another very big challenge in terms of how do you deliberate for decision-making in vaccines is of course that if you have a rare disease or if you have a cancer, uh, rare cancer or not, uh, an oncological disease, you have a very specific patient group in terms of expressing how they perceive the disease and so on. For vaccines, that is not how it works, of course. And we do not really have very sound, comprehensive mechanisms of deliberation uh, that can have representativeness and legitimacy. Um, there are some efforts being made, but certainly not comprehensively and not at the EU-wide level. So this would be something, you mentioned an EU-wide clinical. Uh, I would not say clinical, I would skip the clinical because there are many other ethical issues that we're encountering and legal issues. And I think some of the challenges that we encountered that HTA could factor in, but they're currently not being considered, is having very high regional variation. Um, I think in the Netherlands we have the Bible Belt, for example, whereas um, in, uh, uh, in, in Greece we have, and in other places, we have pockets where people are very reluctant to share information. And discussing with colleagues from Germany, I also have seen general practitioners that are very reluctant to share data for their patients and how they're doing in terms of putting together evidence on how well their vaccines may work and what harms may be there. Um, and for vaccines, I think in the long run, um, I do not know how many you have come across this. I mean, forgive me for going into COVID. We have also many questions coming to us in terms to what extent something may be uh, uh, a long COVID after effect from COVID versus what something may be an after effect from multiple vaccinations. And of course, you try to say that the evidence is there, you can access it there, this is what we have, but not everybody has this level of access. Another aspect which is for me critically interlinked to transparency is not only sharing evidence on mechanisms and so on, but trying to elucidate them. Um, to say that we have uh, an ETAG that would be convenient two, three times considering this evidence does not necessarily allow um, a healthcare practitioner or a general practitioner, somebody in the field or a patient or, or a healthy citizen indeed to understand all these mechanisms. So you need to build slowly, not only transparency, but also literacy in these topics. And this is a very big challenge, I think, for vaccines uh, because they have not been the focus. We have been discussing life course immunization for many years, but the focus was on campaigning, not on generating evidence and then making this evidence uh, accessible and um, readily understood in a format that can be accessed by the public. And you need to progress a bit on that. The biggest challenge that we had, and I think the biggest opportunity is, is in terms of transparency. Um, we've seen a little bit in Norway on that and also with very basic tools, um, is building level of trust of citizens. So the more transparent you are, the higher trust you have. This is not necessarily something you factor in um, in terms of, of how you assess a particular vaccine, but it's also a collective effect. So um, if you have, vaccines are also seen by the population collectively. So if a vaccine is, is doing harm or is doing something particularly well, other vaccines for, for other modalities will be also uh, affected uh, disproportionately, I would say, or proportionately uh, in an equal degree, which is certainly not the case for different medicines. And last, but certainly not least, um, there are other aspects which have to do not so much with vaccine development, um, but have to do with the very intense debate that we have, uh, trans transparently, but, but not with understanding of the structures in terms of how things are taking place. Um, Mr. Chairman, Professor Ricciardi mentioned what an achievement it was to go to a decision for R&D. 
potentially a lot of investment uh, for vaccines at the beginning of, of the pandemic, and a decision to step in. Uh, Article 168, uh, beyond the cross-border health, allows for a lot of flexibility in making decisions for public health and societal welfare in the EU. Uh, sadly, it took a pandemic to, to sort of activate it, and, and I do not know, we have a new body, we have HERA, so let's see what happens out of that. Um, but I have to say that in, in public health also we have lagged behind because traditionally um, there is a component for vaccines for generating evidence that has to do with the European Medicines Agency and there's another one that has to do with the CDC or DTAGs. These have not been naturally cross-talking. And as also some of you may know, there is an expanded, extended mandate for more collaboration there. And there is also something that we need to do more work because it is not clear who is responsible for many of these aspects. Uh, at EU wide level, let alone at regional or national level. And the, and the last but not least, I would be cautious and a little bit wary of transferring best practices from one country to the next, including for transparency, because there are very different value systems and very different perceptions. Not a lot of translation, mistranslation too. So um, I think for, for us, part of the transparency effort is also slowly building knowledge and, and literacy and getting public health professionals more familiar with clinical modalities and clinicians more familiar with public health priorities, health economic priorities, and also R&D aspects, which they're not aware of. Um, because also prior to the pandemic, we had very limited investment uh, in vaccines, including in our region, which is developed. So as a last message, I would say that the most important thing that we need for transparency is establishing a baseline and moving a little bit over um, the papers. We tried to put something together a couple of years back in the HCA stakeholder network and explain at the time also to the Commission that we were a little bit concerned because we were not seeing vaccines really scoped for in the regulation. Um, we hope that this will change and we hope it will collaborate more with others. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we have the opinion of the European Commission by Dr. Inversen, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much both to my co-panelists, but certainly also to Vaccine Europe for this uh, useful presentation that we had in the start uh, that was outlining the vaccine assessment and the decision-making pathways across the European Union. Um, from the side of the European Commission, which I'm representing today, um, we would like to highlight again the role that is played by these national immunization technical advisory groups in these processes. Um, and I will say a little bit about how we are trying to support NITAX in uh, sharing knowledge, in supporting each other, uh, in making this whole decision-making process uh, more consistent and transparent across countries. Um, and for the NITAX, uh, I'd like to st just make it clear that we're speaking about independent groups of national experts that are fundamental for the success of national vaccination programs. Can you hear me actually? Does it work? Okay, thank you. Um, and these experts, they carry out the scientific evaluations needed to make evidence-based policy and program decisions. And on the basis of that, they provide recommendations to the relevant decision makers, most uh, notably uh, ministries of health. Um, I believe that you're all in here aware of the Council recommendation on strengthened cooperation against vaccine preventable diseases uh, that came out in 2018 and also of the Commission communication that uh, preceded it. Um, in both of these policy uh, initiatives, we could also see it as, as only one, but basically it was two papers. Uh, and in both, both of them, there was emphasis on strengthening the efficiency, the consistency, and the transparency of the decision-making on vaccination by facilitating technical cooperation uh, between NITAX. Um, this is also uh, retained in the roadmap that the Commission developed to implement actions in the two policy initiatives. Uh, in addition, um, we had a European joint action of on vaccination that you may also have heard of. It uh, ended in March this year. Uh, and as part of their work package four, they uh, explored the cooperation between uh, NITEX in the European Union and the European Economic Area. Uh, and they provided a number of observations and recommendations in that re uh, respect. 
um, in the middle of all this, I mean, time-wise, things are sometimes a little bit overlapping. Um, and meanwhile, while all this happened, uh, the European Union and the European Economic Area NITAC collaboration was established by the ECDC. That happened in October 2018. Uh, and the aim of this was to share information between NITAC uh, in many ways. Uh, the objective was to exchange existing and new scientific evidence, but it would also it was also to generate uh, up-to-date scientific evidence uh, via systematic reviews. Um, it's the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. That's one of the Commission's uh, scientific agencies, and they uh, play the role as a secretariat for this collaboration. Uh, it's a volunteer network, um, and it was established with uh, nominated representatives from uh, all the EU or uh, EEA member states. Um, I mean, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic was not good for many things, but uh, in a way it was good because this NITEC collaboration has actually been very active during the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and um, it provided a forum for exchange of opinions, um, mostly uh, well via webinars also because of the situation uh, as such, but, but actually it, it turned out that these webinars were actually a, a good way of bringing NITAX uh, together to, to discuss uh, COVID uh, vaccination, but, but also other things. Uh, most recently also uh, monkeypox uh, vaccines. Um, I would like to say more specifically today that the Commission recently launched a call for tenders to support collaboration between NITAX. Um, it's a service contract. Uh, it was signed in September 2022 right some months ago um, and it's it's being done in collaboration with with the ECDC um, it's a tender uh, for a duration of four years four years sorry uh, the budget is two million euro and it's entitled service contract for systematic reviews of scientific evidence on vaccines and capacity building activities um, and the Sorry, the aim of this is very concretely to support member states in their decision-making on national vaccination plans. Um, and, I mean, due to the pandemic, this was also seen as, as support for, for needs regarding COVID-19 uh, vaccines uh, and, and also adapted vaccines. But, but, I mean, all vaccines are actually included in this collaboration. Um, there are three main tasks or work streams in this project. Um, first of all, the, the consortium needs to carry out 16 systematic reviews or rapid literature uh, reviews. Um, they also need to prepare and execute uh, online training on methodologies in uh, assessing uh, evidence, because this is something that is needed. And, and we see here that, that um, some night tags will um, be able to learn from others here, particularly um, NITEX in smaller countries who sometimes struggle to, to carry out these uh, assessments themselves. Uh, and the third uh, task is, is uh, actually uh, various capacity building activities uh, to strengthen the collaboration. Um, it there will be physical annual meetings. Uh, there will also be so-called twinning visi visits where um, members of NITAX will um, visit uh, other NITAX. Um, and, and last uh, but not least, uh, there will be a digital repository to support this collaboration. So this is, uh, for the moment, being the Commission's way of supporting the NITAX while taking into account that they are uh, national bodies with a national competence in uh, vaccination. Um, this is something that, that, that we have to respect. Uh, and this is why we are, are, are doing this as a support to, to collaboration between these, these NITEX. And of course, we, we recognize that uh, more collaboration, more consistency between these processes is needed. This is not a new wish. It's something that has been there for years. Um, but again, we need to we need to respect the the national uh, competence uh, of vaccination of member states, and this is why we're doing it this way. 
So thank you very much for this. Oh, thanks to you. I think it's very important and we have to praise the European Commission. We, we are actually working with the Commission now almost 20 years. I'm looking at the difference of the pace of the action. There is a perfect alignment between political willingness and the technical capacity and concrete proposal and concrete funding, not only in the domain of uh, infectious disease, but also in the domain of cancer in general, but European collaboration. The pandemic has certainly uh, sped up the process, but the European Commission is doing a really great job. Thank you very much, and we appreciate it. Um, now it's time for you, if you want to make a comment or a question to the panelists that made an excellent job providing us with very important point of view, but also very concrete actions that are carried out in this domain. Any, please, can you, can you come and take the microphone? So Valérie Hilek, thank you for the very nice presentation. So you have seen that with some of the colleagues, um, uh, well. Can you just introduce yourself? Yeah, Valérie Hilek from MSD. I'm also the chair of uh, the market access group of Vaccine Europe. I've been the primary author of the publication we were discussing, which is the basis of having a better knowledge of what is happening at national level. Um, I would like to have a question to, to you, European Commission, because I think you, you share with us a lot of what the Commission expressed as willingness to improve overall access to vaccine, far beyond only the evaluation and, and the market access pathway. I mean, it's, it's going about implementation, about vaccine confidence, about training of healthcare professional, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a lot of things which has been done through the joint action on vaccination, I think. But coming back to this new uh, tender on uh, NITAD coordination, I think there was this initiative you mentioned in 2018. And on this initiative, there were a web page which was developed uh, at the very beginning, and then nothing more happened. So we, as industrial, but I think if someone from the lay public wants to know what is discussed there, what is the program of work, what are the outcome, we couldn't leverage every anything that has been done because there were no communication. And again, now there is this new tender with a scope of work where, where you express 16 literature review, et cetera, et cetera, but on which topic? What are the aim? What, what, which disease are we targeting? What, how can we contribute? Um, HTA methodology. We, we are facing this, uh, and it's a huge challenge from an authority perspective, from a country perspective, from um, population perspective, from company perspective, the joint HTA regulation, which aim, in theory, to accelerate access, to facilitate equity of access across European country, to address several challenges. It's already a huge challenge for drug. It will be an even biggest challenge, I think, for vaccine. Of course, it's always biggest when it's your direct concern. And I don't see anything in the scope of work about how can we make and ensure that, let's say, the vaccine ecosystem, including NITAG, is ready for the joint HTA to come. So here I'm, I'm making a clear call on more transparency on what will be the outcome and regular communication on what will deliver this network, because we are really missing that. We are kind of blind there. So thank you for your comment. Do you want to reply? I mean, I, I, I can reply very briefly uh, in relation to the NITAX tender. We just call it the NITAX tender. Uh, I mean, uh, the idea is that member states th themselves will be involved in the selection of topics. Um, and it's a tender that just started. Uh, meaning that, that so far there is nothing to share. Um, of course, it, it will be very much also the European uh, Centre for Disease Prevention and Control who will kind of uh, figure out what the topics could be. But it's very important that, that, uh, that this work serves the needs of the countries and is driven by the countries uh, and, and, and they will be uh, involved in the selection of topics. Um, I cannot comment on how concretely they want to share this. I mean, normally there is a project website where you can see such things. Um, but, but the idea is that you will have this digital uh, repository to support the coalition, but the shape of this has not really been decided yet. Thank you very much. I think there is a plenary starting. Uh, I think it was a good session. Uh, Dr. Quidditch, do you want to have a very, very short final comment uh, for to your proposal? No, I wanted to thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 
Alexa Cosma, thanks for watching Justin, and thanks to Elena uh, for, for, for joining this call. I think this is a, a, a first step. I mean, from our side, I mean, this is a position where we want to open the dialogue. In fact, it's a multi-stakeholder uh, platform that we want to open as well with the aim to uh, collectively see how we can improve uh, the time to uh, population access to vaccines because for me it's uh, ethic that we need to fulfill. Uh, I, I really believe that primary prevention and vaccination is uh, an important public health tool that we need to, uh, to ensure that everybody has access to as quick as possible. So for me here, the what I want to share is just that uh, we are opening a multi-stakeholder platform to dialogue, to debate on what needs to be done, and we invite everyone that is interested to join, to participate. So thanks very much to our speakers, and thanks very much to you that have participated in this debate. Thank you.